We'll dismiss the kids to go down over to their children's class so the kids can make their way over there. Thanks. Oh, yeah. And uh, Pastor Tim and his kids are down in Myrtle Beach right now, and I'm glad they are. They didn't, like, you know, abandon ship or something like that. This isn't a plan for a while, but they were, uh, it, was, it was time for them to have a vacation. And so they were glad to get away, and that coincided with um, the, the, the pastor's conference that, that yeah, actually matched the heat wave too, right? So they got away from that. They had their own heat wave, but that's okay. They're by the beach, right? Uh, but that also matched the timing of the, the pastor's conference that he and I got a chance to go to last week. So thank you for, I guess, thank you for, in, as we continue to, to give as a church, that's part of the budget, just to give us a chance to go, you call it professional development, call it just a, a chance to refresh. It was all of those things. What I appreciated most about that conference was it wasn't so much about uh, interacting with cultural issues or how to sharpen your skills as a pastor, but more just really encouraging us in our own walk with God, in our own devotional lives. And it reminded me that I need to be more obsessed with God, if I can use that word, instead of being obsessed with anything else. And my relationship with God and digging deep and and into His Word and spending time, almost you could call it, meeting with God every day. And so that was a really good encouragement for us. And he said he was jealous that he wasn't going to be able to preach after a week like that. Because he's all bubbled up and ready to, to spout out. But he'll save it for a, a little bit later on. Uh, but we're thankful for that. Uh, beyond that, we're thankful that uh, a few updates just for our church family here. We know the Bickles were with us last weekend. As, as, um, as From what I understand, they made it driving from here all the way to Arizona where they will land for now. At least what Jerry was saying was for the, at least this next year anyway. They had been in Indonesia for a while, serving there. Uh, but now because of just family circumstances with, with Ella growing, and uh, it was a good fit for them. So they're back in the States, but they're doing a lot of the admin work behind the scenes, maybe even recruiting for that kind of work that they were doing. And that's based in Arizona. So it's tough, right? Because you see them for one week. It's like, oh, we're so glad you're here. Goodbye. <laughs> but we know that's where God wants them. And so we're thankful that, that they're continuing to follow him. We're also thankful that they just had a safe trip driving from here all the way over to Arizona in uh, several days long, but no issues from what I can tell. Um, one last update I want to just or mention really positive. Andrea and James, you know, have been expecting for a while, and she was able to give birth Monday morning uh, to a little baby boy. I'm, yeah, we we'll clap for them. They're not here, but maybe they'll... Uh, Maybe they'll listen in on this sermon. They'll hear us clapping for them. I, I'm not going to say the name because I want to give them the privilege of doing that. So we'll let them uh, kind of explain it one-on-one -on -one as they want to. But we're excited. It was um, a little more challenging situation. They had to schedule a C-section for her because of the way the baby was positioned. But, but uh, from, from what we understand, it was a really smooth process. And uh, now we just want to keep praying for them, pray with them. Because it's a longer recovery process. With her, it sounds like the baby's doing fine. Little baby boy. Uh, Diana, you told me seven pounds and 14 ounces. Every ounce counts. I want to make sure we get it right. 14 ounces. Okay. Uh, so we can praise God for them and uh, just His goodness to them this week. And then just pray for them as first time parents. That there's a lot of transition to, to come with that. We'll read here from Hebrews chapter 11 in, uh, in the scriptures. Uh, that's not on the screen, actually. I'm sorry. So we'll just need to use our worship guides on page 9. And after we read these scriptures, we'll spend time praying. Praying for Pastor Tim and the Bickles, the, the Kareckis. And obviously, we, it, it, our church is not the only church. So we pray for other churches around us as well. Pray for God's church in the city and for what he's doing. But we'll start and we'll kind of focus our minds here on the account of Abraham by reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one, Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, You have spoken to us in Your Word already today. 
You've reminded us that even as terrible sinners, as the worst sinners on the planet, you still show mercy to us. You speak to us through your word, and that speech is an invitation to come back to you, to return to you. And as your people who have done that, we are still in need of that, but we thank you that we can be rightly related to you, and now we can join Abraham and others as those who are, are pilgrims on this earth, believing in you, trusting in you. We thank you, thou, you how you have shown yourself faithful even this past week. You've shown yourself faithful to Andrea and James, and we praise you for this. No birth is taken for granted, Lord. And we are glad to celebrate the life of this little one, and we pray that you would strengthen him. Allow him to grow in a fear of you and a love for you. We pray for James and Andrea that you will help them to help Andrea specifically to heal from this procedure. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given her already. We pray that you would continue this process. It is a long process, and it's an important one, and that's why we want to bring it to your attention and remind you about it right now. We pray that you would help them all each to transition to this new stage. Uh, in this is even the baby's first time being a baby, and he doesn't know what to expect, and he's so dependent. And it's their first time as parents, and so we ask that each, each uh, person would, would be able to transition smoothly. Would you give grace in all the different stages? Give them patience and, and wisdom. Help them to be full of energy for sleepless nights and, and weary days. Help them to delight in their son. And we thank you that they can do that. We thank you, too, for the safety you've given uh, the Richmond family and my family with traveling, both driving and flying. We thank you for Pastor Tim's uh, opportunity to take a break, and we pray that you would restore his soul. We ask you would continue to strengthen him, heal him where he needs it. We pray that the kids would have a safe and a relaxing time there with their family. We pray you would bring them back and bring Pastor Tim back full of energy. More importantly, bring him back walking closer with you than he ever has. And very aware of, of what you would want him to be preaching about how you want our church to grow, what direction you want us to go in. Lord, we pray that you would guide our pastor in that way. We also uh, pray that you would continue uh, to work in Jeremy and Dina. Thank you for the safety you gave them as they drove across the country this week. Pray that you will help them to settle and find good, healthy uh, friends and relationships that can really strengthen them in their own faith. Help them to settle into the work that they have there. Uh, working with their, their organization. We pray that you would give them wisdom and creativity and the ability to connect with others who would be interested in the same kind of ministry as what they have been doing. We pray that you will bless every church in the city. Lord, we, we are in great need of, of your gospel to be preached with clarity and with authority. We need to hear from you, not only in this church, but every other church that preaches the gospel. And so we pray that you would continue to bless those churches. Perhaps they're finished for the day or they're having a service later on this evening. Lord, would you bless them and grow your people and use us to be a powerful influence in this city. We pray right now that you'll bless this time in your word. Teach us what you want us to learn. There's so much to learn and there's um, so many ideas to consider. We pray that you'll allow the important ones to stick and to, to continue the work of changing us. Thank you that you have spoken. Please help us to listen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week is the 4th of July. <clears throat> I don't know about you. Different people have different ideas for the 4th of July when they think of... Usually we think of picnics, the day off, perhaps. Fireworks. Is anybody going to Manhattan for fireworks? No. We've been to fireworks now. Whatever. Yeah. They'll let the tourists do that, right? Sometimes we like to go to Staten Island and try to see a bunch of them or go upstate and look, look at all the other fireworks away from the people. Right? Or maybe you just know there will be plenty of fireworks in my neighborhood. I'm just going to stay at home and I'll just listen to it while I'm trying to go to sleep at night and we'll all enjoy Fourth of July that way. Simple enough. Some people then get really patriotic and they start talking about the founding fathers, the people who started this nation. And no country is a perfect country at all. Every country is broken in many ways. Uh, it is neat to see how God used a lot of the, those who are beginning our country, writing the Constitution, to try and really be careful about preventing one person from dominating. They developed three different branches of government, separation of powers. They really had tried to, to be really wise and careful because they know that we can't trust human nature. 
So let's put as many people in place in the political system, that way the people keep the people in check. Whether it works or not, well, it depends on the people. And that's why we see our country continues to be broken. But a lot of people do give attention to the founding fathers, those who were really helped to start a good, our country on a good step. Uh, what I want us to focus on, though, is a more important founding father, and that's Abraham, actually. Um, you've probably heard the children's song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. And they do like a little hand motions. It keeps the kids occupied, I think, a little bit. There are times I would sing that song and I would think, he's not my father. My dad's upstairs or my dad's somewhere else in the building. He's not my father. Uh, father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them and so are you. Well, praise the Lord. How does that work? And that's what we'll dive into a little bit this morning. But for the most part, what we'll try to do is get a survey of Abraham's life. A survey of Abraham's life. And I know this is very dangerous. Whenever Pastor Tim tries to do a look at a book, we kind of hold our breath. And we're really thankful to get a bird's eye view of, of an entire book. So for instance, last week he did First and Second Samuel in one sermon. That was really helpful for us to get a big picture. So then we're, when, we, when we are reading through First and Second Samuel, we can kind of get a sense. Okay, this is where this story fits in the bigger picture. We'll try to do a look at a person this week, and um, I'll have the chance to preach the next two weeks as well, while Pastor Tim is focusing on life group books and uh, more writing than speaking. But what we'll try to do is, each of these weeks, try to give attention to someone from the Old Testament, uh, in this case, Abraham, and see how God used him. Now, we know kind of a few things to mention. No human being is perfect. So whenever we, th whenever we hear someone say, be like Abraham, it doesn't mean be perfect like Abraham is perfect. We know that's not the case. And in fact... Uh, and the account of Abraham, we see a lot of ways where he failed. And he, and he feared, he was afraid to believe God and to take God at his word. So sometimes we learn from people's good and bad examples, and sometimes it's the same person. Uh, but we want to learn from that, and really we'll see a lot of passages in the New Testament towards the end of our discussion that really point us, and they talk about Abraham, and they really show us how we are supposed to apply lessons from the life of Abraham. So what we'll do here at the beginning is go over a survey of Abraham's life. And before we jump in the details here, there are some handouts on the back table I neglected to tell uh, Danny or Mookie about. I apologize. Next to the Life Group booklet display, I think there's a stack of papers. At the top, it's called Abraham, Friend of God and Father of Our Faith. That's it. So I think there's 50 of those. Hopefully we have enough for everybody. I'm going to pull up Pastor Tim and give you way too much information. <laughs> and then you can take it home and digest it later if you want to. But this is trying to help us get an overview of his life. What's interesting is we are introduced to Abraham when he's 75 years old. The first time we meet him is when he's 75. We know about his father over in Genesis chapter 11. The very end of the chapter, his father starts in, in Mesopotamia, not in Canaan where Abraham lived, but he began to travel, and partway through his travels, uh, he died. His father died, and they ended up settling in that city for a while. And it's interesting, as you work your way through the end of Genesis 11, you learn that Abraham was one of three sons. And at their original homeland, one of the sons was married first, had a son, and that first brother died. And after he died, his dad decided to move with his two remaining sons and his grandson up to where the father eventually died in Haran. And then, that is the point where we're really introduced to Abraham for the first time. And you may have heard of his, his brother's son, his nephew, his name was Lot. There are some stories about Lot here in Genesis, but that's the family connection. Lot was likely a little bit younger than Abraham, but not terribly young. Uh, he was fully grown when he tr traveled with Abraham. But as we walk through these stages of Abraham's life, you want to focus on the side of the paper that is a little bit smaller, has a smaller table, and it gives the different stages, chapter by chapter, kind of what the chapter is about. We're not going to have enough time to go in detail into every chapter, but this is going to give us a little reference point. We'll have a few verses as well on the screen to give us a clear idea. So the first stage one, we're going to say this is where Abraham believes God promises. The very beginning in Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to Abraham, and this is the very first thing that we read about Abraham in chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. 
and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So what does Abraham do? Verse 4. He gets up. Abraham went up. As the Lord spoke to him, Lot, Lot goes with him. And the end of verse 4 tells us Abraham 75 years old. So put yourself in Abraham's shoes. You've kind of traveled a little bit. You've moved a big move once. But now you're in a new spot and God appears to you. And actually we find in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is preaching about this. And he says, God may have spoken to Abraham even when he was younger, earlier. But the first time it's recorded here in Genesis is at 75 years old. What does God tell him to do? Get up. Well, before you move, verse 1, leave. Your job is to leave. Who are you leaving? Your relatives, your father's house. Abraham, your job at 75 years old is to leave your family. Yes, bring your wife, and you see his nephew a lot comes with him. But everybody else stays there. That's a tough task. Because, where is he moving to? What does God tell him? I'm going to give you the address of where you're moving. Here's the GPS pin. Dink! Just hit directions, and you'll be there in approximately 25 months. No, what does he say? And you look at it in the end of verse, th uh, verse 1. Go to the land which I will show you. When you get closer, then I'll tell you you're here. Just start walking. Just leave. I'm not going to tell you where your destination is. All I'm telling you is you've got to leave. And go this direction. That's a pretty challenging set of instructions. And God is so good because He often gives us promises with His instructions. So what are the promises He gives to Abraham? Look at verse 2. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great. You shall be a blessing. And then, I'm on your side, Abraham. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And a really interesting phrase at the end of verse 3, In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Pretty impressive set of promises at the beginning of his interactions with God. So at age 75, Abraham decides to move. And this map gives us a little bit of an idea of um, the direction he's in. I'm trying to see... I don't think this has a laser. Oh, does it? Oh, it does. Okay, so Abraham starts down here in Ur. That's where he begins with his dad. His dad moves with him up here to Haran. Here's where God appears to him. We just read that. And from there in chapter 12, that's where he makes his way down here to Canaan, where modern-day Israel is. So God tells him, leave here and go this direction. Go south. And then I'll show you where the land, where you need to stop moving. And you can trust me because I have promised to bless you in astounding ways. Ways really, we read this, if you're Abraham, you're hearing this for the first time, it's hard to even understand all of it. But what's really impressive to us is that he obeys. So that's the beginning when he receives God's promises. Later on in chapter 12, he goes down to Egypt for a time. There's a famine in Canaan, and it's really interesting. At the very beginning, this first chapter, he lies about the identity of Sarah, his wife. She's my sister because he's afraid that the, the Pharaoh there in Egypt will, will want to marry her and so kill her husband so he can have her. And it's interesting in that count, this is a man who is, he's not talking to God at all, he's just making a decision based on fear. He's got to protect himself. And in reality, Pharaoh finds out about it, kind of confronts him and says, get out of here. And what's really interesting, end of chapter 12, verse 18, I'm just going to read from my scriptures. We don't have enough time to put all these verses on the screen, but you're welcome to read along with me. Genesis chapter 12, verse 18. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you've done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So I took her for my wife. Now, here's your wife. Here's your wife. Now take her and go. Get out of here. And it kicks him out. And if you're more familiar with Genesis, that sounds a lot like what Adam and Eve experienced. You're banished. Go away. Same language that is used here. So that's chapter 12. Chapters 13 and, and 14 talk about his interactions with Lot and Lot's uh, growing more rich, wealthy like Abraham is. And there's not enough space for both of them. So you remember the story, Lot, Abraham gives Lot first pick, which really is impressive because he was older. He would, you would think he would get first rights, first choice. But instead he lets Lot choose and Lot chooses because that area looks more fertile, more healthy for my flocks. Even though I know it's close to a sinful city, I think it's worth it because it's more valuable territory over there. After he leaves, this is what we see. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have this here, but Genesis, end of chapter 13, 
God appears to Abraham and gives him another promise. Chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord says, Now lift up, after Lot has left, now the Lord says, chapter 13, verse 14, Now lift up your eyes, look from the place where you are, look north and south and east and west, all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. And he goes on to explain that Abraham's descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. And it's really ironic that just after Lot says, I pick that spot, and he starts walking, then God says, hey, Abraham, look to where he just looked. That's going to be yours, actually, <laughs> because you are gracious and humble, among other lessons there. And he interacts with Lot. May God makes the promise to him. Chapter 14 is a really interesting chapter, how he was to rescue Lot, who had actually moved into the city of Sodom at that point. And after he rescues him, he meets Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem. And Melchizedek blesses Abram, and what does Abram do in response? He gives tithes to Melchizedek. Really interesting. The spoils of war go to this king, and it's a form of worship to the God Most High, who just delivered this, this army into his hands. And then the king of Sodom walks up. Oh, you're talking to that king, and you're giving money to him. Huh, well here, take some money from me. Here's a thank you gift. And Abraham says, I'm not going to touch that. I don't want you to say you made me wealthy. That, that money's not mine to claim. And it's really neat seeing his integrity in that kind of a, a setting. Here in chapter 15, this is the next main point where God appears to Abram here in stage one where he's receiving God's promises. Read with me here from verses 5 through 7. God is speaking to Abraham, and Abraham's confused about, you said I'd all, I would have all these descendants. I don't have any kids. And the only person who I'm, I'm, who's living with me is not even related to me. My, my, my highest steward, my servant in the household, I'm going to give all my money to him, but he's not even related to me. And this is what God says in response. Uh, beginning verse 5, And he took him outside, and he said, Now look toward the heavens, and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. What an amazing picture. God takes him outside, and he says, look up. Count those stars. They didn't have light pollution back then. So you saw a lot more light than the stars than we would have seen if we go outside. All these stars. And then God tells him, your descendants will be as many as all the stars. You're worried about your one son? Trust me, Abraham. I make a promise to you that your descendants will be as many as all the stars in heaven. It's a pretty big promise. We may be tempted to hesitate. What does Abraham do? Verse 6, he believed in the Lord. He trusted the Lord at his word. And because of that, he, and you see there is a capital H, he, God, reckoned it to Abraham as righteousness. It's a really big verse that shows up a lot in the New Testament. This is an example of someone believes in God, and because they believe, God says, Great, I declare you forgiven. I declare you innocent and righteous. Because you believed, I forgive. That's the transaction that God has with Abraham here. It's a wonderful thing for us. And Paul mentions a lot of times later in the New Testament, um, something that I'll mention at the end of the sermon, so we'll save it for later. But he believes God, he's considered righteous, and because of that, God reaffirms his identity. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So there's the, the same set of promises. So that's the first stage God blesses him with. The second one, though, is only in one section, chapter 16. This is where he doubts God's promises. And it's interesting now, he's 86 years old. That line is the timeline of Abraham's life. 75, he's told to move. Now, 11 years later, he's 86. And nothing's happened yet. And God promised a son. And at this point, we're not very optimistic here. And it's neat that Sarah is the one who makes a suggestion. Verse 2, actually, she, she blames God. Chapter 16, verse 2, she says, Behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So, tell you what, I can't have kids. God's not blessed me, so you have kids through my servant, Hagar. Really sad account. And we'll consider these different people in detail in a moment. But this is a time where Abraham realized, God's not keeping his word, so I've got to make things happen. God's not upholding his promises, so I've got to manipulate my circumstances to make it work. God's not keeping his word, I'm going to make sure it happens anyway. And this is a time, every time in Scripture we see people thinking that way, it is not a good trend. 
And what we see as a result of that in chapter 16, Hagar becomes pregnant. At the end of the story, she has her son Ishmael. Sad conflict between Sarah and Hagar. And Sarah blames Abraham when she's the one who started it. Such a sad account. But this is a moment in, in this stage here where he does doubt God's promises. And he tried to negotiate with God or make it happen on my terms. What's amazing, though, as we continue on, is God does continue working in Abraham's life. I'm sorry, that was the... Uh, I'm mixing it up a little bit here. Stage 2. Stage 3 is where we say, would say he receives God's promises. And it's... There it is. Okay. Stage 3, he receives God's promises. How old is he now? In chapter 17, verse 1, when Abraham was 99 years old, Whew, 75 to 99, that's a long time. It's like 24 years waiting for God to fulfill His promise of His Son. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, where is He? And then God appears to Abraham again. We'll look at some of those verses now. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. This is such a sweet set of uh, sweet conversation between God and Abraham. Abraham's 99. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I am God Almighty. And notice, God makes promises because of who He is. He says, I'm God, that's why you can trust me. I'm God, that's why you can trust me. I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And here's the promise connected to that command. I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. Verse 3, what does Abraham do in response? I love this. Here's this unbelievable promise from God. Falls on his face. Acknowledging God at his word. And God continues to talk, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, that's father of many nations now. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And he continues that set of blessings. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations from you. Kings will come from your line. I will establish my covenant between you, me, between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. And listen to the nature of this promise. It's not, I'm going to make you really rich, Abraham. What's the nature of this promise? I'm going to be yours. I'm your God. Verse 8, I will, I'm um, sorry, the end of verse 7. Um, this covenant will be for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. What an unbelievable personal interaction that God has with Abraham there. And it's a reminder that God's covenant promises to us are not just promises to bless us and make us really happy and fat. His promises are meant to make us close to Him. That is the most blessed life possible. The life that's close to God is a life that is truly blessed. And it's a life that is most fruitful as these promises are that He makes to Abraham. Well, after this account, God gives more details about Abraham's true descendant will not be Ishmael. It'll be Isaac, your son through your wife, Sarah. And he actually is, is so specific. Um, verse 21, chapter 17, verse 21, God tells Abraham, My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So now God tells Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and he'll be born this time next year. I have committed myself to a timeline. Countdown, Abraham. Here's the clock. One year from now, your wife will have a son. And you're going to name him Isaac. That, in my mind, would be so reassuring to Abraham. Okay, there's a countdown. We're getting more specific. We're getting closer. And as part of that process in chapter 17, this is where God in, introduces the idea at that time for circumcision as a sign of the covenant. And this is the, the, the Jewish people continue that in the Old Testament as a, a symbol of, I am part of God's covenant people. And Abraham is willing to do it, and it's really impressive. Verse 23, that very same day he obeys God's command, at 99 years old. And through that, he's able to show, I am truly one of God's people. That's not for today. We're thankful for that. But that was showing his willingness to obey God and, and, and follow his directions, even in that, at that time. So we see that he's receiving God's promises now. He believed them before. He doubted them, but now he's receiving them. And now God begins to answer. And I love this. Chapter 18 is a really interesting interaction between God and Sarah. But 
<clears throat> Sarah is not quite sure, can I believe him or not? She laughs to herself behind the tent door. <laughs> Would God really let me have a son within a year? I'm so old. And then God knows that she's laughing, and so he, goes, he comes to Abraham. He's talking with Abraham there outside of the tent. Abraham, why is your wife laughing? And Sarah, I didn't laugh. <laughs> yes, you did. They have a little argument, you know. There's Sarah arguing with God. Bad pattern. <laughs> Uh, but God still reassures her, yes, within one year you will have a son. From that point, the, the scene switches back to Lot for a little bit, and God interacts or, with Abraham, and they have a conversation about the destruction that's coming to Sodom, the city. And Abraham pleads for God to be merciful, or more specifically, to be just. How can you be just if you punish innocent people, righteous people? Would you actually punish the city if there were any negotiates with God? The, the highest number he starts with, would you actually punish the city if there were 50 righteous people living there? And he negotiates them down. How far? 50. What about, what if there are 45? Come on, if five less people you destroy it. What about 40? This is the end of chapter 18. So 50, 45 to 40, down to 30, down to 20. End of verse 18, verse uh, chapter 18, verse 32. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And it's neat that as God, uh, Abraham appeals to God's justice, he doesn't say, Don't punish them. They don't deserve it. What he says is, Don't punish the righteous who are in the middle of the city. Spare the city because of the righteous people. And what's neat in chapter 19, God kind of does the inventory of the city, and there aren't ten. But there are some people who need to be rescued. And that's why he sends angels in in chapter 19 to, pull, to rescue Lot and his family out. And it's a heartbreaking chapter. It really is. But it shows God's necessary response to sin. He must judge sin. And he will always rescue the righteous. It's always the pattern of God. He must judge sin, and he will always rescue the righteous. Even a foolish person like Lot, we'll look at it in a moment. But that's chapter 19. Then chapter 20, we come back to the good news with Abraham. I'm sorry, a little bit more bad news for Abraham. In chapter 20, within one year of his wife giving birth, he still is fearful. And it's the second time where he lies about his wife being his sister to another king who wants to marry her. And as I read this, I just realized, wait, God just told you your wife's going to have a son within a year, and you're still so afraid that they're going to kill you and take your wife that you're going to lie again? God just said you've got a countdown. Don't you trust Him? He, there are moments where you just show us a lot of indecision on His part. But at the end, God is merciful because He appears in a dream to that king Abimelech in chapter 20, and He warns him, don't you touch her. She's someone else's wife. And it's really, he uses strong language. Don't sin against me, God says, with this great sin by committing adultery. And it's very likely Joseph has this story in mind when he's confronted by Potiphar's wife. Because he uses the same reasoning. It's sin against God and it's great sin. So in this case, God warns the king, don't you touch her. She's already claimed, I have a plan for her. And then he confronts Abraham, who for the second time looks really, really foolish in front of this king. So the end of chapter 20. To Sarah, Abimelech, this king says, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it's your vindication before all who are with you. Before all men you are cleared. Okay, you can go back to your brother now. And he kind of mocks her quote-unquote connection with Abraham at that time. But now he receives God's promises. The end of chapter of this stage of his life. This is all within one year. Now Isaac is born. And it's so exciting to see these verses. <clears throat> Chapter 21, verse 1. The Lord took note of Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. I can imagine it's like Abraham's, like the, the, the person writing this down, you know, Moses ultimately, he's writing this down and it's like his pen is trembling in excitement. It worked! It finally worked! He's here! Just listen to the excitement of these words. Sarah conceived, bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time. He did it! God kept his word at the exact time God said to him. And then verse 3, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him. He's like, let me just repeat that again and again. This is my son. He was born to me, and Sarah bore him to me. Yes! And I'm going to call him Isaac. Laughter. Joy. So much 
joy and rejoicing at God keeping his promise to Abraham. It's really powerful at the end of this chapter because at this time, Hagar and Ishmael are sent away from Abraham and his family with God's direction, God's permission. And it shows that God is just as faithful to Hagar and Ishmael as he is to Sarah and Isaac. And a lady who was ignored and rejected is still just as loved by God. So gracious to see God's faithfulness. But what's most amazing is for us to come to chapter 22, though. Because that same son who was born and is celebrated is now going to be, from God's perspective and what he asked Abraham, do he wants his son to be killed. We read these verses in Genesis 22. Now it came about after these things, after all the celebration, after Isaac is beginning to grow, maybe he's a young teen at this point, he has to be at least old enough to walk a while and carry wood. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, now here are the same descriptions. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Kind of adds to the, the intensity of this. And he tells him, go to the land of Moriah. Again, start walking and it's, you're going to go to one of the mountains I'm going to tell you about when you get there. And I want you, it's pretty graphic, what does he want him to do? Offer him as a burnt offering. Kill your son and then burn him as an offering to me. That doesn't seem to match God's plan, right? And he just told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and through that son you're going to have countless descendants. And we just celebrated his birth and his growth. Now I'm telling you, give him up. And yes, he's the son whom you love. That's a tall order. And we would be really paused and paralyzed at that idea. What's really amazing is the next verse. I'm sorry, verse 3. The very next verse says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. He split wood for the burnt offering and he arose and he went. And as you read through chapter 22, I would really encourage you in your own time, read chapter 22 especially. It's a, it's a movie. You're reading a movie when you read chapter 22. There are a lot of action words. It's like you're reading the scene moment by moment. And the closer they get to Isaac being offered, the slower the pace. So he kind of gets up in the early morning, let's go. Fast forward three days, they're still walking up to the mountain. And he tells his servants, Isaac and I will go and we will come back to you. He tells the servants, we will go and we will come back to you. But God told him to offer his son as a sacrifice. Maybe it's like a, a, a giant game of chicken. And God's trying to see, how close will you get, Abraham, huh? How close are you going to get? Are you really willing to obey me? So he goes. And as you continue to read chapter 22, he has a quick conversation with Isaac. Isaac's asking, Father, yes, we have the wood, we have the fire, where's the lamb? And Abraham's answer is so powerful. Verse, chapter 22, verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on, and they kept walking. And they finally come to the place, and then this is the slow motion part of the movie. Verse 9, Abraham, Abraham built the altar there. He arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. You see the, just the slow, slow pace of this part of the scene. And he grabs it and he's right there. And his heart's breaking. And we may be asking, Abraham, what are you doing? What are you thinking? That, that, that's like the exact opposite. What's really powerful as we look ahead to the New Testament to try and guess what Abraham is thinking. Hebrews 11 gives us an insight here. Hebrews 11, the author is showing that... Oh, I've got to read it. I just can't describe my own words. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. And it was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered, this is Hebrews eleven nineteen. Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. And in that way, he received Isaac back as a type, as a preview of what would come later. 
So Abraham goes preparing to kill his son. Is he willing to kill his son? Yes. Why? Because I believe that God will keep his promises. I'm going to obey God's command and I'm going to trust his promises at the same time. So I'm going to obey him and if God wants me to kill my son, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I'll do it because I believe God's promises and so I'm convinced that God will raise my son back to life even after his body's been burned. Amazing faith! And it's beyond our ability to comprehend something like this, but this is the faith that he has. So this is a man who truly has received God's promises and what's exciting as we move on from here really quickly, stage four, is where he affirms God's promises. <clears throat> Chapter 23, Sarah dies. He's now around 137 years old. After she dies, he spends a whole chapter negotiating for a burial plot. Why would you spend a whole chapter negotiating for where you're going to bury your wife? Well, remember, God promised him the land. And up to this point, he really hasn't claimed much of the land. Well, for the first time, he purchases property. And what does he purchase? A burial plot. Not like half the kingdom. Not like, you know, the most valuable real estate. Uh, just give me the cemetery. I just, I've got to bury my wife. Please let me bury my wife. Chapter 24, he sends Isaac or he sends uh, his servant to go find a wife for Isaac. And it's really neat in that setting that the girl is still very honored because they respect her, they give her jewelry, they ask what she thinks before they decide on this marriage. But in this case, this is where he is affirming God's promises. You'll notice in chapter 24, verse 5, the, the servant is asking, what if the woman doesn't want to come back with me? Should I take your son with me? Should I bring Isaac back to the land where all the ladies are? Where your family is? And notice Abraham's really strong response. Abraham said to him, verse 6, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my birth, who spoke to me, who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. He's reflecting on God's faithfulness to him. The God who has been faithful to me all along, Oh, God has shown, He has strengthened my faith so much, I know He's going to take care of my son. At the very end of his life, he's just, it's a done deal. God will keep His promises. Don't worry. You'll find her. In chapter 24, it's a really fun story of the servant finding her, coincidentally, and, and how they shared stories, and her family is convinced that this is God's plan. She's convinced this is God's plan for me to leave with this, this servant of my uncle, whom I've never met, our great uncle, I guess. And I'm going to marry this, this man, Isaac, whom I've never met. And yet she's convinced, and it's a really fascinating account. And then chapter 25 is Abraham's death. I don't have those verses on the screen, but he's described as dying as an old man and satisfied with life. Okay, that was a kind of a quick survey. Our mind is probably full of details. That's why you have the paper to look at later on. Let's get three big ideas. Three big ideas for this. Three big themes. First of all is interaction with others. I want to mention a few other people in the story of Abraham, and they really stand out. The first one was Lot. He's called righteous, he's rescued as a righteous man, but in this account in Genesis, he's very much a foolish person. He started out with blessing, and because of his greed, he decided to move as close as he could to a sinful culture without being affected by it. But eventually, he was absorbed into it. He, called, he ends up living in the city and actually sitting at a spot where the leadership of the city would sit. And he calls the men who confront him when he's hosting those two angels, he calls them my brothers, trying to connect with them. And he stoops to just horrific levels. Um, you're welcome to read the story on your own. He, he, he stoops to horrific levels of uh, lowering his standards to keep everybody happy. But in the process, he actually forfeits his family. He forfeited his sons-in-law because he goes to warn them. There's destruction and they mock him. They think he's joking. And they eventually perish in the destruction of Sodom. He loses his wife because she's so closely tied to her home, she doesn't want to watch it be burned. Or she can't stand to watch it be burned. So she turns around and is looking back, no, no, no. He loses his daughters who have no sense of morality themselves. And they bring Lot down with them. And he's really not heard from again. He disappears from the story. And it's a good reminder for us of how easy and how dangerous it is to accommodate sin. Not only Lot, though, we have Sarah. She's kind of like the skeptic in the story. At the beginning, uh, can God keep his promises? I don't know. This is probably me. I don't know. That's a, within a year, you know how old I am, God? 
that's not realistic. Come on. And it's really needed that interaction with Sarah. God says, is anything or any word, is any promise too hard for me to keep, Sarah? Is any promise too hard for me? And it leaves her hanging. She doesn't answer it. But what's neat, in Hebrews 11, she is honored as a woman of faith because by God's, by faith, she had strength to give birth to Isaac. <laughs> and so she is honored because, you know what? It's happening. And I need God's help. And I'm going to give birth to a boy at 99 years old. <laughs> and God sh strengthened her faith. So at the end, she's actually honored as a woman of character. It's also neat to see her interactions with Hagar. They are horrific. Sarah was such a bitter woman and so rival, such a rival and resentful of, of a situation that she suggested at first. It's such a, a sad account, but it's not the end of the account. The last person we'll just mention is Hagar, and this is such a, a sweet story because likely they, they, they had her join their household when they went down to Egypt in chapter 12. So she jumps in this household of, of, of Abraham and Sarah, and now she's just a pawn, and she's just being told, so you're going to have a son. And then now, uh, well, I'm jealous of you, so you're kicked out. And, and two different chapters, chapter 16 and chapter 21, she's just heartbroken with the Lord, and both times thinks she's going to die, and both times God appears to her in person, and He reassures her, listen, I have promised to bless your son. I will take care of you. And the first time he tells her, go back to Abraham, he'll protect you. You need to have your child there in Abraham's household. And then later on, I'm going to bless your son. And he helps her to find some water for her son who survives and ends up being the father of his own set of 12 tribes. Really powerful story. But it's so encouraging for us that even the minor characters in the story are not forgotten by God. We are not forgotten by God. Quickly, we'll mention that Abraham has both faith and fear. There are times he trusts God and times he doesn't. And lastly, we'll just remind ourselves that he eventually did have confidence in God. I am confident. God will keep his promises. Yeah, I had moments where it didn't look like it, but long term, the more I grew in my faith, the more I was confident. And I want to make a really important point uh, here. When we talk about Abraham's example of faith, uh, actually I'll save that when we get to uh, the next section. Well, let's go quickly to lessons from Abraham's life. Three basic lessons. First of all, a really clear point. You must have God's righteousness. You must have God's righteousness. This is more an explanation of, of, of who we are as people before we become Christians, before we come to Christ. Because we're born as descendants of Adam and Eve, we are all born naturally sinful and automatically guilty before God. And we live a life that is independent of God, seeking our own things and wandering away from God constantly. And because of our sin, God, the just judge, must punish our sin. He must punish your sin, otherwise he wouldn't be fair or just. We don't want a judge to dismiss criminals because they haven't done it since then, and they only did it one time. I only murdered that guy one time, judge, so I'm okay now, right? No, he's got to punish sin. He must. Otherwise, the, you know, he is not fair and just. But what's amazing is that... <coughs> He can give righteousness, He can declare innocent people who believe in Him, who trust in Him. And that's the second big idea. You must trust God's promises. And when you do like Abraham did, you can have that righteousness credited to you by God Himself. And I'll explain it this way. This is not just believing that there's a God. Or believing that God exists and I think He's really, really important. Um, it is entrusting myself to God. In Genesis 15, it says Abraham believed in, it's like he believed into God. He collapsed on God. And he wasn't trying to keep himself standing up. He wasn't trying to impress God or add to what God would do. He knew that I contribute absolutely nothing to God's righteousness or God's promises. All I contribute is my sin. And Pastor Tim has illustrated in the past as like a parachute where we're about to go skydiving. And there, we're up in the plane, and if you keep the illustration consistent, it's like we were born on the plane. <laughs> and we've got to jump out of the plane at some point when we die. And some people could say, oh look, that's a parachute. I know what that is. That is a parachute. I know what that is. And it's like people who say, I believe in God. There is a God. I believe in Him. I know what He is. I'm ready to jump. <laughs> Not quite. You have other people say, I know that's a parachute. And I, I believe that's a strong parachute. I think that, is a, that parachute is that's a high-quality, industrial-strength parachute. 
I bet that parachute is solid. And that's the person who says, I believe in God. Oh, God is so, oh, His promises. Yeah, praise God. And I love talking to Him. But they're not trusting in Him. They're just talking about Him. But then you have the people who look at the parachute. That's a parachute. And I know that parachute is strong. I need to put that on. And I put it on. And I lean out the edge of the plane. And they count to three. And I rock. And I'm ready to go because that parachute's on. That's true faith in Christ. It's not enough to believe that there is a God or even that He's a good God or all these things about God. You must trust into Christ. You must personalize this for yourself. For some of us, it's, it's a prayer. All of us, it's a hard attitude where we're saying, Dear God, I am trusting in you. I can't contribute anything to you. I can't impress you. I can't keep the Ten Commandments. I can't do anything right. I need you. I need your mercy and your forgiveness at all because I'm living in Sodom right now and I can't get out. I'm trapped. I need your mercy and we just collapse on God. That's the kind of faith that Abraham showed in all of God's promises and we can have that as well. But as believers, we can also have these promises from God that are easy for us to forget. There's a simple promise, whoever will call in the name of the Lord will be saved. What a glorious promise that is. What about a promise, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come again and I will receive you to myself. Do we believe that promise from God? Do we believe the promise at the same time because of His Holy Spirit? He can also say, I will never leave you or forsake you. Or my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Can we believe and trust in these promises even if they seem to go exactly opposite His commands? He says, do this hard thing at work and I will provide for your needs. We think, if I do this hard thing at work, I'm losing my job. That doesn't match. That God, that's where faith in God says, I'm going to trust your promises and obey your commands and I'm going to believe that you'll make both of those work out at some point. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe we've got a lot of learning to grow. Abraham waited another 25 years before his son was finally born. But there is a point where God's promises will match his commands. And it takes faith to be convinced of that as well. One other point I'll make about this, this doesn't mean that I have to pray really hard or try really hard or trust really hard. Ah, I'm believing today, tomorrow. Uh, I'm a kind of a weak believer. Ah, and good days and bad days as a believer. What's really neat, and when Abraham believed God, that was counted as righteousness. God had grabbed Abraham and he wasn't going to let him go. And there are moments that our faith from our perspective is weak. But in those moments, our God will not let us go. He will not leave us or forsake us. And we can be confident that the God who has saved me will not let me go. We sing the song, He will hold me fast. That's why it's so valuable to us. We have low days. We question, am I a Christian? Is there a God? Am I forgiven? I, my feelings are so powerful right now. I can't, I can't have faith because of all the feelings I'm feeling. That's why God says, your, your, your grip is kind of weak right now, but I've got you anyway. I mean, there still is confidence there. The last point we'll simply make is you can be included in Abraham's blessing. Uh, on the back of the one sheet, we have a list of three basic elements of God's promises to Abraham. The land and descendants and this international blessing. Do we fit in that promise to Abraham? Absolutely! Absolutely, and I'm convinced from Scripture that, that God still is working in a unique way through Jewish people, the Jewish nation. Romans 11 really makes that clear. In addition to that, all believers are considered children of God, or children of Abraham. Heirs with Abraham of this kind of attitude. Several passages, Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 11, we mo looked at a moment ago. As believers in Christ, we are spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. Hopefully so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. <laughs> and we can praise Him for keeping His promises, including us in these promises and being faithful. Because God kept His promises to Abraham, God will keep His promises to us. We'll finish with one quick illustration and we'll be done. Uh, we're at, let's imagine <coughs> that uh, I'm going to Use Michael and Maya for a quick illustration. That's okay. Not embarrassing, I promise. Let's say that <clears throat> Brother Kevin is going to talk to Michael and he says, Michael, I need you to take out the trash for us. Really? Ah, take out the trash. Listen, Michael, I know you don't want to. Here's the deal. If you take out the trash for a whole week, 
I'll give you $5. It used to be a dollar, but because of inflation, we'll make it five. So I'll give you $5 at the end of the week. Really? Oh, wow. Are you sure? I'm sure. And Michael thinks about it. I don't know. Should I? He is my dad. I mean, I'm part of his family. He is, he's giving me a lot of other things. Mean, I eat food every day. I think he has $5. <laughs> Will he keep his promise? I don't know. I think he can. I'm going to obey his command and trust his promise. So Michael decides to take the trash out every day of the week. Here comes Friday. And his dad comes up. Oh, Michael, I saw you did all week long. Well done. Here's $5. Oh, he obeyed dad's commands and he got the reward. Dad, dad kept his promise. Hey! That's like Abraham. Let's fast forward two weeks. Now brother Kevin goes to Mai. Hi, Mai. I need you to take out the trash for a week, and if you do, I'll give you $5. Is it easier or harder for her to trust her dad's promises? Why is it easier for her? Because she saw that he kept his promises to her older brother. She saw that he kept his promises in the past, and he's the same dad, and he gives just as much other stuff. Surely he can give her $5. And so she obeys. She takes the trash out five days in a row. She gets the five bucks at the end. You know, we're amazed at faith like Abraham's. I mean, really, if God asked us to, to sacrifice our children, that, that's horrific. And it's something that we would, that's why I just, I, I, I get so sobered in that account, especially now with, with two young sons. But what's encouraging to us is God kept his promises despite those challenging commands. And if God kept his promises to Abraham, surely he can keep his promises to us. And we can be confident in our faithful God. He is the same God as He was thousands of years ago. He does not change. He is eternal, unchanging. And so we can trust in Him. Let's bow in prayer. We'll give a moment shortly to, to give you a time to pray by yourself. Maybe there are some promises you need to think through again for yourself. <clears throat> Maybe you need to confess some doubt or hesitation. Maybe you're realizing for the first time, I need to trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I need to put the parachute on for myself. I need Him to grip me and not let go. I need true forgiveness, not just a happy feeling on a Sunday, but I want confidence that my sins are forgiven for eternity. I'd love to give you a moment to, to pray individually to the Lord right now. After the, uh, we'll finish having a moment of quiet prayer, then I'll, I'll close this in prayer. We'll have a few announcements. But now is the time to talk to God. Let's take a few moments of, of quiet individual prayer. Father, we thank you that you are so faithful to us, your children. You kept amazing promises to Abraham and to Sarah. Even during the times when they questioned you or failed to trust you, you did not let go of your grip of them. And we praise you for this. We praise you that you include us in that same family. Through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed, and we can be, and we are in that number. We praise you for this. We ask that you would grow our faith and enable us to obey you, even when it seems to go against your promises. Grow our confidence in you. Help us to recognize true blessings as your presence. Knowing God himself as my Father, being certain of an eternal home and of His permanent presence even now with me. And the confidence that we can be used in such a broken and a hurting world to share your promises that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
We praise you for this. We ask you give us grace, more grace to trust you and to obey you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.